Hello, and welcome to this lecture entitled Alabama's Great Depression, 1921 to 1942. We'll examine these three topics, the depression in Alabama agriculture of the 1920s, Alabama in the Great Depression proper, 1930 to 42, and those New Deal agencies that were important in Alabama until the beginning of World War II. Because Alabama was an overwhelmingly rural state, it didn't enter the Depression in 1930, but in 1921. Alabama's population of 2.3 million in 1920 was 78% rural, and that meant living in places of fewer than 2,500 inhabitants. So the fate of agriculture was the fate of Alabama's citizenry. World War I ended in 1918, most troops returned by mid-1919, and the entire world suffered a forgotten pandemic, the Spanish flu, that killed millions between 1918 and 1920. Following that, the American economy passed through a short but sharp depression, as it often does after a war. Furthermore, the boll weevil completed its 10-year spread across the entirety of Alabama by 1920, devastating the cotton economy almost as much as the fall in cotton prices over the 1920s had. Trade resumed between England and its cotton suppliers in Egypt and India after World War II into the 1920s, so the scarcity prices of 35 cents per pound in cotton in 1921 fell across the decade. With the onset of the Depression in 1930, cotton fell even more precipitously to 5 cents per pound, lower than at any time since the early 1880s. And here's the perverse thing. The more cotton there was on the market, the lower the prices fell. But to get enough money to pay their bills, Alabama farmers had to plant more cotton, thereby exacerbating the glut. You can see from this slide how badly agriculture fared in the 1920s. Farm ownership dropped from 96,000 to 75,000 farms in the decade, and tenancy rose. The size of farms shrank from an average of 75 acres to 68 acres, with a more than corresponding drop in value. Farm size fell about 10%, while farm value fell almost 38%. By the time the stock market crashed in October 1929, Alabama and its farmers were desperate. Here we'll look at how the Great Depression drove Alabama to its knees. We saw that the agricultural economy suffered in the 1920s, leading many Alabamians to flee the farm for cash wages in towns and cities where industries boomed. By 1929, Birmingham had 100,000 full-time wage and salary earners. But almost immediately after the stock market crashed, aggravated by increased tariffs, retrenchment, and bad monetary decisions, the bottom fell out of the entire U.S. and Western world's economy. Alabama's industrial unemployment rose to 25% from 1933 to 1940, while its non-farm employment, that is all non-farm workers, not just industrial workers, fell by 15%. A very telling statistic is that by June 1932, of those 100,000 workers in Birmingham in 1929, only 15,000 remained employed full time. 25,000 were completely unemployed and the majority, and here's the statistic that everyone ignores but is devastating, were underemployed. 60,000 of those 100,000 workers wanted full time work but could not get it. This drove a drop in personal income in the state from an already abysmal $311 in 1929, which in 1922 money is only $5,310, to $194 in 1935. That's $4,140. Uh, 
in 2022. In the first half of the depression, the North Alabama Industrial District, the Birmingham Industrial District, saw a 50% closure rate of mines and heavy mills from about 3,000 to about 1,500, and a 25% reduction in iron and steel production. This both signaled and caused reduced industrial orders. On the other hand, textile mills weathered the storm much better mostly by employing problematic strategies. Though there had been a bit of a shakeout in the industry in the 1920s, for example, uh, Huntsville's Dallas Mills lost 1.8 million in the decade, that's 16 million in 2022, Alabama's textile mills only lost 4,300 total jobs throughout the entire state from 1929 to 1935. Here's how. Mill operators use wage cuts and what's called the stretch out and the speed up, assigning more machines to each operator and increasing those machines output speeds, and exploited the unemployed's desperation to drive wages down. The problem was that with Section 7A of the 1933 National Industrial Recovery Act, upholding workers' rights to organize and strike, Textile workers in Gadsden struck in 1934 for better conditions and wages. This launched the great textile strike of 1934 that spread from Alabama through the Carolinas into New England. Although it was ultimately unsuccessful, it damaged those textile companies severely. State and county politicians were baffled by the rapidly unrolling disaster of the Great Depression and used very old ideas to address the problems. They all diagnosed the Depression's cause as one of overspending, when the exact opposite turned out to be true. But in the short term, they didn't have any money, and they had few ways to get any money. Governor Frank Miller, had run for office opposing the progressive agenda of his predecessor, uh, Governor Bib Graves, and progressive meant that the state spent money on services. And Miller found it difficult to act against his basic nature that was summed up in his nickname, Old Economy, quote unquote. Retrenchment was his one trick. And as private demand fell and with it tax receipts, he tightened government's belt. Many tax plans came forward, including a highest in the nation gasoline tax and a bump in the sales tax. And Alabama did pass an income tax. But even after private charities were overwhelmed and Miller used federal grants and loans to fund the Alabama Relief Agency, he was so parsimonious old economy, that the feds had to cajole him to spend money they had already provided to him. What the state and county governments did was to cut services. For example, they shortened the school year to two to four months. They didn't provide textbooks. And eventually, they paid public employees in what's called warrants, because IOUs just sound cheap. Here's an example. Professors at Alabama Polytechnic Institute, now Auburn University, were not paid at all for the 1932-33 academic year, except in warrants that no one would accept. And the state refused to say when they would be redeemed. Well, they were redeemed in the summer of 1934, but the window for redemption was only a few weeks long, and few script holders were ever informed of the redemption opportunity. Many in the summer of 1934 who held script were simply out of state. People responded to the crisis like they always do. They tried to make it day to day for the most part, but they opened themselves to options, some of necessity, they might not have considered otherwise. Now, as I noted before, many city workers who had not been long off the farm moved back to the land. At least they could eat, we say. But the demand to grow cotton for cash superseded using the land for food and contributed to the cotton glut on the world market. Those who could get relief, or who could get on the relief rolls, that is, did so. 
and later, New Deal programs employed thousands of people in Alabama. There was a dramatic uptick in movement, physical movement, traveling in search of work or other opportunities, mostly by young men. In just a few months of 1933, the LNN Railroad reported it removed 27,000 hobos from its trains, and there are stories of trains packed with such travelers. It was on one such train in North Alabama in 1931 that nine young African-American men were accused of raping two white women because they first appeared in court in Scottsboro and were convicted in Scottsboro. They were dubbed the Scottsboro Boys, and their case became famous around the world because of appeals orchestrated by the Communist Party and the NAACP. As the Depression deepened in 1932 and dragged on thereafter, Alabamians began eyeing more radical analyses of the crisis, and many became more open to radical solutions. The Communist Party USA sent an organizer to Birmingham who got a Communist Party chapter off the ground there. It said that the chapter published the newspaper, The Southern Worker from Birmingham, but one authority maintains that it was published in Chattanooga and used Birmingham on its masthead to throw off both the authorities and vigilantes. And they might have needed to. For soon, the, the CP chapter in Birmingham found threats against it and its members so tough that it went underground. The CPUSA also began organizing sharecroppers, focusing on central Alabama pretty quickly. The sharecroppers union that resulted from the CPUSA had 30 local chapters that ran themselves with only a nominal attachment to the Communist Party. The sharecroppers union supported programs like debt relief, letting croppers market cotton directly rather than through the landlords who they accused of cheating them, cash payment for crops rather than scrip or merchandise, and a standardized payment of 75 cents per hundredweight for cotton. The union had 600 members in 1932, but an altercation in Tallapoosa County led to death threats and drove them underground too, though they grew to 8,000 members by 1934. New Deal programs and suppression drove the sharecroppers union out of business and it dissolved in 1936. But labor unions grew in strength, especially as workers interpreted Section 7A of the National Industrial Recovery Act as a green light to organize with governmental blessing. The AFL's Committee on Industrial uh, Organization, we refer to that as the CIO, but then in 1935 it became the Congress on Industrial Organization and broke away from the AFL. It spread unionization among workers who were not in traditional crafts that the AFA, I'm sorry, that the AFL usually organized. The New Deal deployed a plethora of acts and agencies across the nation to try to alleviate the suffering of the Great Depression. In Alabama, some of these were more important than others, although everything the New Deal did affected at least some people and some places in the state. The New Deal was a litany of laws passed by Congress to try to alleviate the Great Depression that had, we know now, bottomed out in July of 1932. Franklin Roosevelt was elected in November of 1932 and inaugurated on March 4th, 1933. He was the last president inaugurated on March 4th when he was reelected in uh, 1936 and inaugurated in 1937. That date was moved to January 20th by a constitutional amendment. From March 4th, 1933, his inauguration for the first time, until June 16th, 1933, Congress passed 16 major pieces of legislation to try to provide relief, recovery, and reform. This is where we get that idea of a presidential report card of the first 100 days of president's term from. Relief legislation paid citizens directly through a plethora of agencies like the Civilian Conservation Corps, the Public Works Administration, the Civil Works Administration, and later the Works Progress Administration. 
recovery legislation tried to aid sectors of the economy. The two great laws here were the Agricultural Adjustment Act and the National Industrial Recovery Act. Reform legislation included the Glass-Steagall Act, the Federal Securities Act, the Home Owners Loan Act, and the Farm Credit Act. Some New Deal laws, like the Tennessee Valley Authority Act, fit all three of these, relief, recovery, and reform. Let's look at the Civilian Conservation Corps. It was created as part of other New Deal legislation, and it employed urban young men in rural camps away from their home. This was to get them jobs and to get them out of town and to get them away from trouble or radicalism. The CCC was arranged in camps and had a semi-military organization, very much like the Boy Scouts. Pay was not great, and most of it was sent to the workers' families or put into savings accounts, so the guys didn't have much spending money. In addition to pay, CCC volunteers had educational opportunities. Some learned to read and write, while others completed high school and learned skills that they put to use later, construction skills, agricultural skills, mechanical skills. In Alabama, by late 1934, 30 camps had been operated and organized, and they operated every year until the program ended in 1942. Estimates uh, are that 67,000 young men were enrolled here in Alabama. Now, these were not Alabama men necessarily. They were almost all from somewhere else. Alabama men went elsewhere for their camps. The CCC not only built and maintained the infrastructure of the camps themselves, but they reforested thousands of acres of forest and worked on many soil erosion projects. The most obvious CCC work and the things that we still to uh, see today was the work they did improving state and national parks. They built cabins, pavilions, lodges, and other structures, mostly from local stone and local wood. In many CCC buildings, we see a particular kind of archway that was part of CCC architecture and then showed up in buildings made by the WPA as well. To get money to the people directly, but keep the dole to a minimum, the New Deal created public works programs. The first emerged during the New Deal proper, the Public Works Administration, established in June 1933 under the direction of Secretary of Interior Harold Eck Ickes. Its job was to hire thousands of skilled workers to build large public infrastructure projects like the Hoover Dam in Alabama, the Public Works Administration, PWA, built the Bankhead Tunnel in Mobile, for example. But Ickes was parsimonious and spent money so slowly that Harry Hopkins convinced FDR to create a new temporary agency to hire even more people in unskilled jobs to get through the winter of 1933-34. This was the Civil Works Administration with offices in many cities, including Birmingham, Montgomery, and Mobile. The CWA employed 129,000 Alabamians. This program got only a partially fair reputation as paying people to lean on rakes and paying for make-work projects in cities. But it did what it was supposed to do, which was to get enough money into the hands of the destitute to keep them from becoming unmanageable. Much of the criticism of the CWA was from business and their allies who did not like that the economically desperate had an income stream that kept them from taking whatever pay businesses offered. The greatest and most memorable of the New Deal relief organizations was the WPA, the Works Progress Administration created after 1935 that employed 63,000 workers in Alabama until 1942. The WPA was headed by Harry Hopkins, who handed it off to Alabamian Aubrey Williams. Its projects were smaller than those of the PWA. Instead of building dams and tunnels, it built schools and libraries and small airports and public buildings, many of which still stand today. Look around for them. 
The WPA also provided for artists, theatrical performers, writers, and other sub-agencies like the Federal Theater Project, various federal art projects like the murals in the Alabama Department of Archives and History Building, and the Federal Writers Project that collected the important slave narratives, which are digitized and available from the Library of Congress, conducted surveys of public records, and wrote WPA guides to the states. Another WPA project was the Historic American Building Survey, which paid a small team of architects and photographers to catalog buildings of local historical importance that were more than 50 years old in 1933 through 35. These images are now digitized in the Library of Congress. They're cataloged along with the American uh, I'm sorry, the Historic American Engineering Record and with the Historic American Landscape Survey images. Interesting to check these things out. One of the most significant New Deal programs in Alabama was the Agricultural Adjustment Acts and the subsequent Agricultural Adjustment Administration. The first AAA passed as part of the New Deal proper in May 1933 and was a far departure from previous federal intervention in the economy. The FDR administration had diagnosed the depression as a problem with surplus uh, product overproduction. So the AAA paid farmers to destroy food and fiber in 1933, then take land out of production. Restricting supply would raise prices, they thought. So in 1933, farmers across the U.S. killed 16 million pigs and poured out millions of gallons of milk. And when the AAA paid landowners to let land lie fallow, those landlords used that money to evict sharecroppers and buy farm equipment like tractors. Because the AAA paid for itself by levying a tax on producers to supply the subsidies to non-productive land, the Supreme Court found it unconstitutional in 1936. Smaller agricultural support bills passed through Congress between 1936 and 1938, and in 1937, Alabama Senator John Bankhead Jr. shepherded through Congress the Bankhead-Jones Farm Tenant Act that made federal money available to tenant farmers to buy land on long-term, that is 30-year mortgages, with low interest rates, with loans through the Farm Security Administration. Then, in 1938, Congress reauthorized the AAA with a constitutional payment mechanism, that is direct federal appropriation rather than delaying uh, rather than relying on a producer tax. One change besides the payment mechanism was that the second AAA required price supports for cotton, corn, and wheat and allowed price supports for many other commodities as the market fluctuated, all in lieu of paying to destroy crops. Another significant change was that what money did go to pay land uh, to let land lie fallow that money went to the worker on the soil, whether a yeoman farmer or a tenant, like a sharecropper, rather than to the landowner. That provided sharecroppers with a separate stream of income and made them less reliant on landlords and furnishing merchants. The Bankhead Jones Act and the second AAA all but killed off sharecropping. Another significant piece of New Deal legislation for Alabama was the Tennessee Valley Authority. Federalization of the Tennessee River Valley and its use to generate hydroelectric power for the public had been a proposal of Nebraska Senator George Norris since at least 1925. Norris wanted federalization of most of the major rivers of the U.S. in order to provide public power and control flooding. Now, Norris got his wish in June 1933 with the passage of the Tennessee Valley Authority Act. The federal government designated 11 locks and dams along the Tennessee River, similar to Wilson Dam at Muscle Shoals, and it bought the exceptionally marginal farmland that the resulting mountain lakes were going to flood. It hired those farmers who were displaced 
to help build the dams and it generated both power and flood control that reversed generations of extreme poverty in the region by allowing for federal installations to come in and for drawing private businesses to the region. Although far from perfect and subject to much criticism because it socialized so much of economic activity and infrastructure that competed with private providers, in Alabama that was the Alabama Power Company, the TVA was a model for such projects and it operates today. The TVA generated power, but what to do with it? George Norris came up with an idea in 1930, rural electrification. In 1936, Congress passed the Rural Electrification Act that created the Rural Electrification Administration that paid electric companies to run power lines to unprofitable areas and provided low-cost loans to farmers who banded together into electrical cooperatives to to operate those lines or even to install those lines. Many of those electrical cooperatives still exist today. The results of the REA was a nine-fold increase in Alabama farms that had electricity from 4,000 in 1930 to 36,000 in 1940. The last New Deal agency we'll discuss is the Resettlement Administration. Part of the New Deal's Federal Emergency Relief Act, FERA, passed in 1933, FERA authorized the Rural Rehabilitation Program to provide credit directly to poor farmers to rent land and equipment. It also let the Subsistence Homesteads Program provide federal backing to loans for poor farmers to buy farmland. Sounds like the Bankhead Jones Farm Tenant Act. In 1935, these agencies were folded into a larger resettlement administration, part of which program was to create farm villages to give the unemployed urban dwellers the opportunity to return to the countryside with support and with infrastructure. The Resettlement Administration built eight farm villages in Alabama and spent, no kidding, nearly 25% of the entire nationwide federal appropriation on four of these uh, farm villages in Alabama. The four they spent almost 25% of the entire nation's appropriation on was the Bankhead Farms near Jasper, Skyline Farms near Scottsboro, the Prairie Farms in Macon County, and the G's Bend Farm in Wils Wilcox County. These last two were for African Americans. The other four uh, resettlement administration farm villages in Alabama were Cahaba Homestead Village, which was immediately called uh, Slag Heat Village, which is near Trustful, Gardendale Homesteads near Birmingham, Greenwood Homesteads near Bessemer, and Palmerdale Homesteads near the little town of Pinson. All of these were in that so-called Birmingham district. Now, to get an idea about what went on, let's look at the Gardendale Homesteads project. Usually, Skylines Farms is the, the one that most people in Alabama point to as a resettlement administration uh, project, in part because what's left of it is really picturesque. But the Gardendale project had a completely unique feature. Eight of its homes were made of rammed earth. Gardendale was a village of 75 homes, 67 of which were wooden frame houses. All of the houses, wooden frame or rammed earth, came with a shed, a pump house, and three to five acres of land. The project authority took applications from families of men who made less than $1,200 per year. And if either adult had lived on a farm, and particularly if the wife had homesteading skills like knowledge of canning, those families moved up the list. When chosen, they were, were assigned to a house and land. They did not pick their own, which led to some consternation with those who were assigned one of the rammed earth houses. Now, a full mortgage on any of the little farms in Gardendale was $3,000 in 2022. That is. Um, 
$51,000 with payments of $13 per month. There were community buildings and a community council. The community itself owned farm equipment and mules that residents could rent to till their truck gardens. These were the only rammed earth houses built by the resettlement community in the entire United States and a few of them still stand in Gardendale. Finally, the Resettlement Administration had some projects that did not turn into farms. Such was Bear Farm in Dale County outside of Ozark. In 1934, the Rural Rehabilitation Program asked county agents to submit proposals to take sub-marginal land out of production through federal purchase. The Dale County agent replied with two su uh, suggestions for parcels of land and heard nothing for literally a year. Then in 1935, the newly formed Resettlement Administration chose one of those parcels of 35,000 acres to buy for what it called the Pea River Land Use Project. The entire deal was completed in October of 1935 for a total cost of $261,000 or $7.46 an acre. The Federal Soil Reclamation uh, Project and the CCC did some reforestation and any erosion work, but little else when war clouds gathered and the U.S. began mobilizing in 1940. Henry Stegall, the representative who had secured Camp Sheridan for Montgomery in World War I, helped secure what was called the Ozark Triangular Division Camp based on Bear Farm, 35,000 acres, but with an additional 15,000 acres for a total of 60,000 acres. The War Department accepted the camp project in July 1941, began building the camp, and in January 1942, named it Camp Rucker. That would become Fort Rucker later, which is now known as Fort Novacell. Okay, so let me summarize. We examined Alabama's long experience with economic depression from 1921 to 1942. Although we usually date the Great Depression from the stock market crash of October, November 1929, Alabama's dominant agricultural economy had slid downhill along with cotton prices as they fell from 35 cents per pound in 1921 to 5 cents per pound in 1930. Then we examined the effects of the Great Depression in Alabama, particularly statistics of economic damage and desperation how the administration of Governor Frank Miller tried to tighten state spending to get out of the crisis, including paying state workers in barely redeemable warrants in 1932-33, and how some of the people of Alabama sought radical analysis of their plight and radical action to ameliorate it. We ended with a long dissertation on the New Deal under the presidency of Franklin D. Roosevelt and a number of acts and agencies that particularly affected Alabama. Those were the Civilian Conservation Corps, a number of relief agencies, the Public Works Administration, for example, the Civil Works Administration, for example, and the Works Project Administration under Alabamian Aubrey Williams. We looked at the two Agricultural Adjustment Acts and the Bankhead Jones Farm Tenant Act. We looked at the Tennessee Valley Authority the Rural Electrification Administration, and finally the Resettlement Administration that created eight farm villages in the state as well as soil conservation projects. So with that, I'll end the lecture. And as always, thanks for your attention. <laughs>